Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today is a book club episode with Philip Riken, and he is going to be talking to us about his new book, Beauty is Your Destiny, How the Promise of Splendor Changes Everything. It's published by Crossway. And so if you go to our show notes, there's a link to Crossway. It'll take you right to this book. So check it out. This is going to be a great episode to learn more about this book and what uh, Philip is talking about with Beauty is Your Destiny. Um, also, if you go to our show notes, just if you're new to our show and you want to learn more about us, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to us there. Uh, obviously, you could uh, subscribe to our podcast uh, channel as well which I assume that you're either watching us on YouTube or listening to us on the podcast. So you found one of the two, just know there's another option out there. And then you can find us on social media. We're on Twitter and Instagram. And then we have an email. And then uh, also just learn about our sponsors that we have, including Logos Bible Software, as well as a link to find a church to call home. If you do not have a church that you can call uh, home and you're a member at, go ahead and hit that local church finder link. Check that out. And then obviously we'll have a link to Wheaton College where uh, Philip Riken is uh, affiliated with. And so you can check that out, that school out for yourself as well. So let's get into this conversation. I'm going to let Peter further introduce Philip Riken today. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce our audience, Dr. Philip Riken. Uh, he's the eighth president of Wheaton College preached at Philadelphia's 10th Presbyterian Church from 1995 until his appointment at Wheaton in 2010. He has published more than 50 books, including When Trouble Comes, and expository commentaries on Exodus, Ecclesiastes, and Jeremiah. He serves as a board member for the Gospel Coalition, the Lausanne Movement, and the National Association of Evangelicals. It's a pleasure having you on our show, Dr. Reichen. Thank you. I love love the theme of... Uh... Guilt and guilt, grace and gratitude, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be on the podcast. Of course, it's our, our it's pleasure. our pleasure, and our audience may remember this. I, I think I've I think I've talked about this. My my first year of college is at Wheaton, and it was the year before you started at Wheaton. It was 2009, 2010. You started in 2010, and I was like, well, I guess I'm going to Biola now. So it's I graduated from Biola, but I know that like that switch happens quite yeah, a bit you should have stayed and for sure so i know i know i was yeah i was uh, so i have to admit and our audience again knows this and i'll be i'll be very honest and involved i was i was on academic probation after my first year because i was i was uh i kind of coasted on my high school smarts and then wheaton hit and i was like oh my gosh this is way way hard i played baseball and football and i was like i could do all of this at the same time um but alas i could not but i do i loved my time at wheaton um, and I, I, I very heartily recommend Wheaton to everybody else who's who's listening to this episode. Well, and hey, you know, if you did a year with us, we consider you an alum. So you just always you can always hold on to it. There we go. That connection. And uh, so awesome. Cool. cool. So <laughs> something I think our audience doesn't know about Philip Riken is you're a big basketball guy. I remember I remember uh, hearing when you were candidating for the position and you were playing basketball um, at the court. So tell, tell our audience a little bit about your, uh, your love for basketball. So I just, you know, grew up loving basketball. I grew up in Wheaton, Illinois. My dad taught on the faculty here for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I started going to Wheaton college basketball and football games probably when I was four years old. So huh. I just always loved Wheaton college athletics specifically, but yeah. mm -hmm. love the game of basketball. And it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong love and I'm still playing. And in fact, mm uh recruited some pretty good teammates this last year and we won the uh, a-league intramural championship yeah, that's so right. um, they, they yeah. carried me this year for sure but i i just love competing frankly mm. um i mean fourth of july cornhole mm. i'm all in win or lose it's just fun to do your best you know test your abilities against somebody else's congratulate them when they do an amazing job i just love a whole mix of competitive athletics yeah that's awesome. We, we, uh, Nick and I are, are CrossFitters and we both play baseball. I, I play baseball at Whedon and then a year at, at Biola and then football at Whedon. So it's, it is, uh, that is a shared common characteristic between all of us. CrossFit are... is a rare be breed. I'm sure you guys are in way better shape than I am. So <laughs> this, I, uh... Nick, I think Nick's a better runner than I am, but I'm, I'm stronger than Nick. Yeah. I will say I played competitive baseball too, even in college, but I've 
I've said this to people. I'm convinced that basketball is the best created sport of all time. Wow, that, that is a that is a claim. I, I do. I think for entertainment reasons, watching it, skill level, athleticism, the objective of the sport, I think it's the most brilliant sport. You're just trying to personally. butter up Dr. Reichen. No, I've always I've said that. <laughs> well, I can say a lot about baseball too, but you know, James Naismith <laughs> that invented the game of basketball was a devout Christian and wanted there to provide recreational yep. opportunities for people to really expand their physical capacities yeah. as an important part of what it means to be a human being and what it means to be a Christian. And there's yep. a, there's a great legacy there in the sport of basketball. I do oh. remember, I do remember re learning that. Yeah, that is, oh. that is true. Yeah. That's so cool. beyond, beyond basketball and beyond kind of your, your academic and, and, and church bio, let our listeners know a little bit more about Philip Reichen. Yeah, so uh, I've been president of Wheaton College for 13 years now. I love being in a college environment. I love the science. I love the arts, the drama, the music, mm -hmm. the athletics, mm -hmm. just everything that happens. And and I've got kind of a lifelong love with college students. When I was growing up as a little kid, we had a lot of college students in our home. We traveled yeah. to England with college students when I was in junior high and high school. Um, and I just really believe in what uh, God does through Wheaton College students as they go out into the world, and uh, it's exciting to be part of that. So I, um, other interests, I love reading. I love, uh, I'm a pretty avid birder, which I don't know that we'll have time to talk about today. Yeah. <laughs> we love playing strategy board games as a family. That's something we really enjoy. Yeah. So those are a few of my interests. Awesome. My uh, cool. my wife's stepdad, I, he listens to this show. Um, he has, and he's, probably going to correct me because i'm going to get wrong on this i think he has 60 or 70 birds at their house they have a little aviary in the backyard and so wow. he got he got really into is it, is it is it called birding is that like a is that an official yeah, term for this? i mean uh that's next level if you've got your own aviary though. he's got his own aviary it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive yeah he's he's big into birds and everybody who knows he's a pastor and everybody who knows him knows he's into birds so it's uh i i uh I have a love hate relationship with birds. I like birds in the wild, but when they're at home and chirping at six o'clock in the morning, it's I'm I'm a little less loving towards them. <laughs> but uh, I I could I could see the love for it. Um. So coming coming into into this book, uh, I love I love your introduction to this because it gives us a little bit of background into this. You describe in the introduction to "Beauty Is Your Destiny" that the book comes from a series of chapel messages at Wheaton College. So, even beyond just the book, what what was the inspiration or, or background behind just providing, writing these and researching these messages in the first place? Yeah. So I, I speak in chapel at Wheaton once a month, and that's a real joyful privilege. love doing that. I usually develop a series through the year. So I'm always thinking about, oh, what, what might I do? You know, so I preach through Ecclesiastes one year. I've mm -hmm. taken different topics at different times, and I've always got a couple topics and I, I'm kind of thinking, oh, this may be the year that I'm going to tackle this particular topic. Beauty is a really difficult subject, actually. Oh, yeah. like getting people <laughs> to like understand what beauty is and think it through. But it's a really important topic in terms of what it means to be human. And one of the things that inspired me was some of my experiences during COVID. Hmm. Um, COVID, like for a lot of people, time to slow down a bit. Um for us, it was, you know, just with our immediate family for a season there when the yeah. state of Illinois was on full lockdown. And there were a number of things that happened. But one was because I was home every day, I was actually seeing what was happening in my garden every day. Mm -hmm. And I've really elevated my understanding of how things grow um, in, in the last several years. And then it started a bit before COVID. But just being there day after day, I just learned a lot of things just by observation. And I sensed that I had a desire to experience beauty at a time of greater isolation hmm. for many people, fearfulness, a lot of disruption in the world, um, just enjoying the simple beauty of what's around us. So, so that was definitely part of it. Then another thing is I often choose a topic that I think will get us into a lot of other topics. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. almost every year, you know, I'm talking, I'm always talking about the gospel. I always want to help people understand who Jesus Absolutely, is. Absolutely. Yeah. Every, every time I, I speak, I want to help people understand that, but we've got a lot of things going on in the world and in our culture. Um, and we need to understand 
the beauty of the gospel, but also the beauty of its implications for how we approach the world, for how we understand human sexuality, for how we relate in a diverse community. And beauty is one of those topics that touches all of the other topics. So it's actually a really good lens for understanding a lot of things about the world and about the Christian faith. But there, there were a lot of things that um, came together in, in wanting to do a year on beauty and then follow up on that by writing and further reflecting on the, on the topic of beauty. Awesome. Amen. Yeah. There's a tradition that I almost forgot that we do on book clubs. <laughs> I was about that... to say, I was surprised you didn't get to this. I and I should because this is a this is a great book to do it on. I, I always read an endorsement of a guest that we've had on our show before during the oh, introduction. Nice. Yeah. Better late than never. I'll do that's, it right that's now. True. Yeah. Um before my first question, since I have the mic now. Yeah. Um so we've had Karen Swallow Pryor on and we've had Johnny Erickson Tata on. So quick little I'm gonna read their endorsement on the back of these books and then uh, this book, and then I'm gonna read my question. So Karen Swallow Pryor says this about your book. Beauty is Your Destiny is a lovely and compelling book that gathers up a treasure trove of insights on one of the most essential qualities of our Christian faith and our very humanity. And then Johnny Erickson Tata says this, if your heart is hungry for vibrancy and joy, color and meaning, then I heartily recommend this volume. So good words from two Friends of yours and two friends and guests on our show before Johnny and Karen. Um, and then so I'm going to jump into my first. You can question. tell we've had Johnny on because we were corrected to say not um Joni but Johnny because we, we learned that her dad wanted a boy and so he, she, he, he named her Johnny and so we were corrected, but that's that's the only reason why we say that correct. Every I think everyone oh. else who doesn't know her says it wrong, and that's the only reason why we can say this correctly. <laughs> So my first question, um, you, so something I, I've found in the beginning of your book, you say that some people write what they know. I tend to write about what I want to know better. I thought that was a very humble and profound thing and just honest thing to say going into a book. I really appreciate it. We both appreciate it. And so talking about the motivation of the book and, and saying that, can you please explain more about how beauty is something you want to know more better? More better? Yeah. So first of all, uh, love love your tradition of reading the endorsements. I those are both women I really admire. To have Karen Swallow Pryor is a great writer. Oh yeah, that's a big book one. Is yeah, lovely. So that that is really good. And Johnny Erickson Tata, I think, is my favorite Christian leader, flat out. And yeah. we don't have time to talk about all the reasons sure, why. Yeah. But it's been a privilege to get to know her a bit um, over the years, and she's a huge encouragement. I'm glad you had her had her on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, usually when you write about something, people think, oh, like you're really an expert on yeah. you know, prayer or whatever, whatever it is <laughs> that you write about. But a lot of times I'm trying, I'm thinking about, okay, what do I want to understand better? What do people in my community need to understand better? And how can I really lean into that? And one of the really great things about writing is you you just learn so much more than you, you, really being forced to put down on paper what you actually think. And, and mm -hmm. the, just you learn so much through that process. So beauty, be I think of myself as an appreciator of beauty, but in all the areas where I'm, you know, I know something about it, but not like a real expert. Like, I, you know, I know some things about visual art and that's something I've really tried to promote on Wheaton's campus. And I've got a lot mm -hmm. to say about the visual arts. I, I know some things about, um, you know, the beauty of creation. And I, I'm not a scientist, but I appreciate some of those things. So I'm, I'm sort of a generalist in a lot of topics. I like maybe know more than people that don't know anything about it, but I definitely <laughs> don't know anywhere near as much as the people that really know mm -hmm. about it. I'm mm -hmm. kind of in that mm -hmm. middle level. So, you know, for me, beauty is, a, as I've said, just a really important subject, and it's one of the really joyful dimensions of the Christian faith. And it's important for us to write about hard topics as well, like things that are painful in a fallen world, and beauty actually does get us into those topics. But um, we are made to appreciate beauty and to be beautiful. So it touches a responsive chord in us when we experience beauty. And one of the things I touch on a number of times in the book is beauty is meant to be shared. So if you have a true experience of beauty, the first thing you want to do is tell somebody else about it, point to it. Yeah. It so sounds like C.S. Lewis. Kind of experience where you just like, I got to keep this to myself. Yeah. Like I saw this beautiful sunset. 
I'm not going to let anybody else know. No, you want to <laughs> share it. Yeah. So it's uh, it's an infectious kind of topic and experience as well. Yeah. Um. Going going, maybe maybe a little bit deeper in a slightly different direction. And this is, I can't say this is directly talked about in your book, but I think it's something that we as Christians need to wrestle with. Um, and it's maybe broader Christianity. Um, and this is something I struggle with, and I'm sure those who are listening struggle with. We either intentionally or unintentionally view the world through what maybe what's called a docetic lens. So it's kind of the physical is not really all that important. The spiritual is really important, which we're not saying the spiritual is not important, but we, we kind of downplay the physical, uh, the physical is ephemeral uh, and the spiritual is kind of all that, all that matters. So what, what is so vital and really so spiritual uh, about looking at the physical and seeing beauty and not saying that the physical is bad. Yeah, so there's a long history of kind of dividing between the spiritual, which is not physical, is more important and maybe more holy or more godly, and the physical, maybe something to be a little suspicious of. And that there's a long history of that going back to the ancient Greeks. Like we could have yeah. a whole long conversation yep. yeah. um, about that. I would just point out to a few simple facts. One is the fact is that God has made us as human beings that are physical. Um, mm -hmm. We're not souls that have bodies. We're actually embodied souls. We are in flesh souls. Like there's an integration there in our per personhood, um, which I think is part of our eternal destiny. That That's maybe something I talk about more at the end of the book. But just the fact that God has, first of all, created us this way as these physical persons and add to that the fact that when, when God saw fallen humanity in its guilty condition, all the things that we had done wrong and all the things that had gone wrong in the created world because of human sin, because of our transgression, God's method of addressing that was not to say, okay, we got to get away with all this physical stuff. Yeah. He actually doubles down on that mm. in, in what we call, you know, a theological term for it would be the incarnation. And that is God, the son taking on human flesh permanently so this is something that sometimes mm -hmm. christians miss as well that oh yeah somehow you know god the son is a spirit he comes down and like for this little 33 year period or however long exactly it was he's this human being and then Leaves what the happens body. after that well what happens after that is jesus is raised bodily eternally yep. one there was one uh scottish theologian his last name was duncan he had, I, I may not get this exactly right, but it, it, the quote is to the effect that the dust of earth now sits on the throne of the universe. Hmm. That is hmm. to say that, that Jesus Christ as the bodily risen son of God is eternally now um, has this glorious resurrection body. So if we look, so what I'm saying is if we look at the past, if we look at what God did to save us, if we look at the future, like wherever every direction we turn, there is no disembodied experience or destiny for humanity. Um, so that just reminds us how important uh, physical things are. And I'll just give one, if, if I can, Peter, I'll just yeah. give one more little example sure. of this. Um, C.S. Lewis has the, the Oxford scholar, fantasy writer, um, has this wonderful book that maybe some of your your listeners will know, um, Screw Tape Letters, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, this yeah. weird kind of story where there's this demon that's trying to tempt this person that's becoming a Christian, mm -hmm. and you might think uh, that the way to really tempt him is mm -hmm. to have him experience these physical pleasures, but the senior demon in the story knows, like, no, actually experiencing physical pleasure in the right way that's a gift from God. It awakens spiritual desires. So these things are are deeply integrated in in our human experience. And um, so a lot more that could be said on that topic. But those are just a few reflections on how important it is for us to be embodied and to appreciate the body and the things that are physical in our created um, existence and in God's plan of redemption. Yeah. Real quick before next next question, just because I think it fits well here. I didn't write this down as a previous question. And we're, we're talking about sin marring physical creation, marring the physical world. Can you talk a little bit, maybe how sin has distorted our, our view of beauty, how sin, it's not physical beauty is wrong, but sin has distorted that physical beauty. Yeah, no. And, and, you know, that's a big, it's a pretty big theme in the book actually, because every topic 
like, okay, let's talk about the beauty of creation. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the beauty mm -hmm. of human sexuality. Let's talk about mm -hmm. the beauty of our diversity in human communities. All of those areas are so badly broken. Um, and, and it's maybe one of the important messages of the book is that the fact that these things are broken does not mean that God doesn't have a purpose for beauty. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, some of the most painful things for us are things that are meant to be beautiful, but then are broken. And what do we do with that? How do we understand that in our relationship with God? Anything we talk about related to beauty, um, we have to talk about the brokenness of beauty in a fallen world. Um, it just comes up uh, again and again. But I also think that if you appreciate beauty, if you appreciate the beauty that God has put into the universe, if you appreciate the capacity that human beings have as creative persons to create beauty, the more you appreciate that, the more painful it is when you see that mm. broken and distorted. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. in talking about beauty, we're actually, and, and learning to appreciate beauty, we are at the same time heightening mm. our capacity for something that is transcendent and something that has the capacity for joy. We are also at the same time exposing ourselves to greater vulnerability. Mm. Um, of, and I, we could give so many examples of that, but it, just take, for example, the gift of a newborn child. I mean, nothing's more beautiful than a baby, mm -hmm. but if you're thoughtful, you realize this new person that has all this potentiality is also going to experience heartbreak mm -hmm. and loss and struggle. Like, you want to push those thoughts out of your mind, but actually we need to experience the world as it is in its beauty and in its brokenness. And it's, it's then that we become more fully human. It's then that we actually can become more useful for God in the world. It's then that we understand eternity better. I mean, all of these things are, are interconnected. Awesome. Yeah, that's good and helpful to underline and realize. I'm glad you, uh, touched on that because creation is good and beautiful is created mm -hmm. good and sin yeah, is we so not... often start at genesis 3 when we should be starting at genesis 1 with the goodness of creation yeah and and sin is not a part of creation it's a distortion of it and it's it's sin is from the pit of hell it's it's not it's not part of creation so and to go into how you're talking about the fighting against gnosticism really that jesus is uh, the king of creation, he sits on his on the throne and he is our hope and he is still in human form. He's still flesh and bone. So it's, that that is helpful to bridge into king of creation, Christ. That's the gospel. Creation is good and beautiful. And it's our hope, too, in, in Christ. And so going talking uh, now, I'm starting to get into the uh, triune God question based on that. Um, so there are a variety of uh authors in a variety of genres throughout the book that display the glories of our triune god's creativity this book is grounded in uh the triune god's glory beauty and creativity in the world and can you describe why you ground the beauty uh foundationally really in the triune in the trinity who creates yeah, no, and I think uh, I think people that have been listening to this podcast will know how valuable it is to understand theology and go deep mm -hmm. into it, not as a way of taking you away from understanding the world and practical things, but actually yeah. as a doorway into it. So I just felt um, if we're going to talk about beauty, like I think when people think about beauty, what's the first thing that you think about? Well, maybe the beauty of creation, maybe the beauty of art. There's yeah. certain things that you immediately associate with beauty. But really, the place to start is with the beauty of God. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. that immediately helps us with a real conundrum, because people will talk about, well, beauty's in the eye of behold the beholder. Like, that's beautiful to me. That may not be beautiful to you. Like, there is a subjective mm -hmm. aspect of our appreciation of beauty. So is there any objectivity to beauty at all? Well, there is. If the Bible tells us that God is beautiful and we if we see things that are beautiful in his character, now we know there is a standard. There is a standard for beauty. We may not always appreciate that standard. We're mm -hmm. limited, not just because we're fallen, but also because we're finite. I mean, we're only human beings. We can't see the total picture, but we also we you know, there are a lot of misperceptions we have and a lot of things that are distorted. 
But we really have something solid to hold on to, which is that God is beautiful. And this is expressed in all kinds of ways in, in the Bible. Interestingly, when people um, see God or see his glory in the Old Testament, it's, all, it's always amazingly beautiful. It's something that people associate with God. But there's also a relational beauty. This is one of the real mysteries. I mean, you were asking me to explain something probably nobody really can uh, explain. <laughs> When, when I talk about Sorry. the Trinity, one thing I go back to is something that Augustine said. Yeah. And he said, look, uh, here, let me explain the, the Trinity to you. And I can do it in seven propositions. God, the Father is God. God, the Son is God. God, the Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. Okay. I get, all right. I, I see a lot of evidence for that in Scripture. The Father is not the Son. Mm hmm or the spirit, the son is not the father of the spirit. The spirit is not the father of the son. So we have these three persons. They are distinct from one another. And then there's one more prep proposition here to explain the doctrine of the Trinity. There's only one God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, now I have something. Oh, I don't know how. I don't know how to put that all together. The unity of God, the triunity of God. But when we look at the way that the Holy Spirit breathes out a Bible that testifies to the glory of God the Father and to the saving work of God the Son. When we see God the Son say, I want you to pray to your Father as Father, and he's a loving Father. I mean, Jesus celebrates the fatherhood of God in the Gospels. And he also says, look, something amazing is going to happen to you. You're going to get this amazing gift. You're actually going to be able to do more than I did. Jesus said, which is amazing mm. to think about. It's mm. because the Father and the Son together send the Spirit into the world. There is this loving appreciation, celebration, and exaltation of the beauty of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And there's something about, so how, and it's a great mystery to us, what you might call the, the relationships inside the Trinity, the mm -hmm. intra trinitarian relationships <laughs> that's a mystery for us we're not going to be able to get inside that we're going to have to see it from the outside but we can see that it's beautiful and that's the foundation of beauty in so many different ways so that, that's just one way of thinking about this but i think who god is and his beauty is the foundation for all beauty there is so i, I like to start at the beginning so to speak um so it's something i wanted to talk about really from the beginning of the book yeah yeah so two two-parter question here. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask these in two separate parts, two chapters um, um, per. So uh, one, I'd like to focus on two chapters, sex is beautiful and beautiful community. Um, and I, I think if we're honest, and if a lot of Christians are honest, uh, descriptors most Christians would use for sex in particular are sacred, covenantal, possibly forbidden, uh, especially for those who are single. Um, but the word that comes to mind least often for them is is beautiful. So why why beautiful? Yeah, so, and I, I think it's an illustration of something we were talking about earlier, which is any of these beauty-related topics, we deal with a lot of brokenness. It's so evident in human sexuality, especially in our culture. Um, you know, and it's so sad. There are people listening to this podcast that have the experience of sexual abuse. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, and there's really nothing uglier or more damaging than that. And yet it remains true that this is something that God gave to humanity as a gift that is meant to be beautiful. And, um, you know, one, one, just a personal experience I have that illustrated yeah. this for me so clearly, I was sitting down with one of my children to explain human sexuality in my own <laughs> fumbling way. <laughs> and this child, as I was explaining this, had a look of wonder and delight. Hmm. Really? <laughs> Just like, wow, like God did this. Like there's this, and he didn't understand it. He was six years old or seven years <laughs> old, whatever mm -hmm. he was. But instinctively, he sensed that bringing two people together in this physical, sexual way was something beautiful and delightful. And, and, it, and, and it wasn't my amazing explanation of it. It was an instinct. It was maybe, you know, um, spirit taught, something like that. 
but that I, I I realize like that's the way to think about this. There's a there's a wonder here. Um, there's a beauty um, that that's important for understanding who God is and our relationship with Him. So many things are expressed in our in our sexuality. The other thing I'll point out, and you know, I get into pretty um, great length in this in in the book as well. Mm -hmm. It is not only in a holy expression of sexuality in sexual relations between a man and a woman who are in a love covenant for life. That's the proper mm -hmm. biblical place for the expression of human sexuality. But it's also when we surrender the sexual dimension of who we are to God's purposes. Uh, all of us have a call to chastity and purity. There, all of us have, as it were, sacrifices we need to make of things that we think would be for our own pleasure. And that's beautiful. And God uses that in beautiful ways in the world. And we see that both with married persons and with single persons. So there's a, um, most, most things having to do with beauty. Beauty, uh, if I can put it this way, beauty is thick, not thin. Hmm. Beauty isn't a thing like you just say it or see it and you're kind of done with it. Like it has layers within layers. And human sexuality certainly um, is like that. So there's a there is a beauty to it, and um, and I, I think the Bible speaks to it, and I think experience can can teach us this as well. Hmm. I'm gonna play a slight devil's advocate on this question. I'll move to the next one. I can somebody's listening to this foresee someone saying, but Dr. Riken, kind of the expression of my identity that's that's what's beautiful, and kind of expressing all the facets of this that's really beautiful. So why why such a minute view? of biblical sexuality why is that more beautiful than what i think it is yeah because when we talk when we think only or primarily about ourselves our own pleasures our own desires or and our own expression that's going to quickly be harmful to other people so um god god gives us guardrails in every area of life um and the and those are necessary those are necessary for beauty and and you know there um there, there are limits in every aspect of beauty. If you think about visual art, there are many kinds of visual art that have a dimension of beauty, but you can't just do whatever you want to do in the arts, even <laughs> if it's damaging or harmful, or even if it's ugly and say that it's beautiful. So there, there's an objectivity to beauty that's rooted in the character of God. And the more closely we align with his purposes, and the, the more that beauty will come to the fore. And I will also say, this is a little bit more complicated argument, yeah. but when our only or primary purpose is our own pleasure, we're not free. We're actually in bondage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the tyranny of the self is one of the worst, most destructive forms of bondage. So God wants to give us a freedom, but it, it, it it's a freedom that comes through a surrender to his purposes that brings greater beauty to all our relationships. Um, and it, and one of the things the Bible emphasizes a lot, which is really hard <laughs> is, um, the Bible doesn't want us to think about ourselves first. It wants us to think about others first. And even if you think about what's happened with a lot of conversation around sexuality in our culture, yeah. how we think about consent, consent to sexual relations, for example, there's an instinct there that is correct, which is rather than thinking about what I want, I need to start with the question of what is good for another person. Um, and that's where the true beauty comes. It doesn't come in any selfish kind of way. Mm. That's that's really really helpful. Yeah. So second chapter I've already talked about beautiful community um, towards the end of the book. So a similar similar kind of question for beautiful community, especially so for those like you talk about in the book who who are fearful of, of the buzzwords. They they hear social justice and they assume that comes with an agenda or ethnic diversity and, and assuming well like is is my expression not is not enough and I need more expressions. Um, it's it's kind of used to kind of weaponize some of these things. How might a community of every size, shape, culture, and background that pursues the gospel and justice be beautiful? Yeah, so it's a great question, you know, and and I, I think um, social justice is a term that has been weaponized. I was reading recently in an article from Carl F.H. Henry, mm -hmm. I think in the early 1960s, might have actually even been in the 1950s. Mm. So a lot of listeners won't be familiar with Carl F.H. Henry, but he was highly regarded as a leading Christian, oh, yeah. evangelical theologian. And this was writing he was doing in the late 50s and early 60s about, and this was his term, social justice. Mm -hmm. When Billy Graham came to the campus of Wheaton College in 1980, 
and dedicated the Graham Center for World Evangelization and for Graduate Education. And um, he talked about this is a center for social justice. That's what <laughs> Billy Graham said, quote <laughs> unquote, social <laughs> justice. And what those men meant by social justice was the gospel doesn't just have implications for my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It actually has implications for my relationships to my community, for how we work as a church, the work of the work of the people of God in the world. Um, and there's an older generation of faithful biblical Christians that said, we are concerned about justification, about a right relationship with God individually, mm -hmm. which comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. And as part of the outworking of our salvation, we are concerned about justice. There's a simple biblical term for this. It's righteousness. And righteousness mm -hmm. is not one dimensional. It's multidimensional. I could maybe do a whole book on righteousness, and we could talk about righteousness in sexuality, righteousness in human community, the righteousness of the character of God and how it works out. Like this is another lens into the character of God and his, his calling and purpose for us. But they are connected. They are not separate. And I think one of the problems we have in the church today is there are some Christians that are like, we got to do something about what's happening in our society, and we, we don't need to spend so much time about our relationship with God. We need to really focus on our relationship with other people. We yep. need justice in the world. And there are other Christians that are very hesitant about that. That sounds like something that's not their political perspective or whatever. They're very concerned about justification, getting right with God. A biblical perspective brings both of those things together. And you, you see it all the way through the Bible. You see it in the prophets. You see it in the apostles. So justice is meant to be beautiful. And justice brings harmony, peace, restoration, reconciliation. It brings the beautiful things when things are broken in human relationships. That's maybe one way of thinking about uh, God's call for, for justice um, in the world. And you don't have to call that social justice. That's not mm -hmm. a biblical term. You can call it righteousness. You can call it biblical justice. Um, I just know the Bible has quite a bit to oh, say yeah. about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It has a lot to say about it. Um, and it's an important um, theme for us. And for me, this is one of the places where looking at the end of the story is really important. So we talked a little bit, mm -hmm. you, you were saying, hey, it's really important. We don't just start at Genesis three. Like, let's take a look at Genesis one and two, what God created good and how beautiful it is. We also need to understand the end of the story. What's mm -hmm. the end of the story? We see Jesus and we worship him together. And when I say we, it's people of every language, every tongue, every tribe, every nation. It's this amazing mosaic of diversity. And that is beautiful it, it will be the fullest most beautiful expression of humanity when the people that jesus christ has redeemed enter into eternity not merely as souls but mm -hmm. as bodies mm -hmm. embodied human beings with an eternal glorious body and when we worship god together not somehow like separated from mm -hmm. who we were in our earthly existence but taken to the next level, I mean, way beyond the next level, it's multiplied. That's the beautiful picture we get at the end of the Bible. And it, it's important to kind of turn to the back of the story, see how it ends, remind yourself from time to time when you're in some of the like kind of troubled spots earlier on in your story or in, in the world story, that's the direction we're going. And, and that's, that's the beauty that God has for us. That's awesome. Speaking of that chapter, I want to give some recognition to Erwin Ince. Another person yep, we've that had we've had on times, our yep. show a couple times, he actually wrote an endorsement as well for your book. And uh, you mentioned him a few times in that chapter eight, Beautiful Community. Uh, Which is what he, we had him on for <laughs> on this yeah, show, yeah. Yeah, a nice quote here from Erwin is, uh, that you put in the book is, God isn't just making a new me, he's making a new we. And uh, so based on, um, you just mentioned, or Peter asked you about a, a couple different chapters, the one on when sex is beautiful, chapter five, and then beautiful community, chapter eight. So uh, every one of your, and this will preface this question I have, because now it's going to be your turn once I get to my question, which one you want to pick to talk more about. But just so the audience understands, uh, the table of contents lays down how you explain the beauty of in order. So you know, the beauty of eternity, Trinity, creation, God's image, purity, God incarnate, crucifixion, Christ's bride, 
and generous living. So those are no, there are nine chapters. And so uh, I know this might be a really hard question because how do you pick from a list? And But uh, we can cross two of them off because you've already answered the question about uh, sex is beautiful and the beautiful community. So uh, give you a chance. What about a third uh, chapter to kind of wet the palate yeah. for the uh, sure. audience? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So first of all, uh, coming soon to this podcast will be an interview with Erwin Ince about Ooh. his forthcoming book, Hope Ain't a Hustle. Well, that's coming out with InterVarsity. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, I don't know exactly when it's coming out, but they're, they're, he's been pushing that book along. I think yeah. it'll be out within the next We're relatively months. good friends with Erwin, so we'll, yeah. we'll ask him about it, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, he, by the way, uh, Erwin Ince is a Wheaton College dad. Ah. Wheaton College trustee. Ah, okay. So, um, uh, you know, I, I really liked his book and I've given away a lot of copies. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure you had a great interview on that. In terms of, yeah, you know, the, the chapter I think is exciting is the one I'm working on at the time, frankly. You know, I'm always excited about what I'm going to teach and preach next. So there's mm -hmm. kind of a discovery process that goes with it. I will say that to me, one of the more challenging chapters to think through is the beauty of the cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a conundrum. There's kind of a puzzle yep. here because the Bible is really explicit. It says about the coming Messiah. This is something the prophet Isaiah said. He had no beauty. <laughs> right. Nothing that we should desire, like nothing you'd want to look at. Hmm. So I've been trying to make a claim here. God is beautiful. The son of God is beautiful. But the Bible says, no, he's not beautiful. Hmm. Don't look at that. So how do we put that together? And it's a paradox uh, there is an ugliness to the cross, which in a way had to be as ugly as it was to deal with the ugliness of sin. Mm -hmm. So this is a, the cross is an instrument of torture. The son of God is put to death in a bleeding, painful way. But in that suffering and death, the problem of sin is being dealt with in a just way once and for all. And there's a beauty of that sacrifice. And I, I think you see it in the world's art. I mean, I, I probably as much as any other, there are, there are some great themes in art that recur, a mother and a child, um, two lovers. But in terms of the frequency of a theme, the crucifixion is right up there at the very top. And there's a, there's a horror to it, but there's also a beauty to it. And, and artists throughout history have tried to capture there's something beautiful is happening here. There's a sacrifice. There's a gift that's being offered. So that's really a paradox to wrestle through in what way is the cross beautiful, even though it is ugly. So just thinking that through, figuring out how to express that, um, I found to be, you know, a challenge. So that's, um, that's maybe one chapter to mention that's in the book. But the other thing I'll just say, I'll, I'll maybe, I'll try to get two in for the price of one here. So <laughs> that's not too greedy. What, uh, this is something I talk about at the beginning of the book and then at the end of the book, which Christians are not nearly as aware of as they ought to be. And that is the Christian hope that we will see the face of Jesus, the physical mm. glorified face of Jesus. And that will be beautifully transformational for us. And that's the thing that we're hoping for and looking for. And there, there have been um seasons in the life of the church where that vision is what you were thinking about and what you were striving for and what you were and pastors were preaching about and I, I think it's a neglected theme um if you wanted to put a theological term on it sometimes it's been called the beatific vision yep this beautiful vision this beautiful sight of the face of god but bible i mean the bible is really clear about promising that we're going to see the glory of god in the face of jesus christ and to see him as he is, is to become like what he is. And that's that's a very important part of Christian hope. And I and if I could just say something to our listeners, I sure. think there is a very deep desire in each of us, not just to observe beauty, but to become beautiful, to mm -hmm. participate in beauty. Like if that were possible, that would be the ultimate thing. And I think so much of um so much of how we view ourselves in a social media context, how we think about how others think about us and how we look and their perceptions of who we are as people, even beyond what we look like. There's a desire there. And, and, and that desire comes from a place 
which is how we were created and what our ultimate destiny should be in Jesus, a desire to be beautiful. It is not wrong to desire to be beautiful. It is deeply wrong to try to acquire that beauty in our own ways and in our own purposes and not to wait for God to make us um, beautiful. But I, you know, one of our hopes should be in the Christian life that as we're going on, we are actually in our character and how we treat people in our joyfulness. We're actually becoming more beautiful. That's a really good and really, frankly, super challenging test. Hmm. Am I more beautiful than I was a year ago? Would the people that live with me every day say I'm becoming more beautiful? And I think when we wrestle with that question, we realize I really need a savior. I, I need somebody, a beautiful savior who has the power by his spirit to make me beautiful. Um, and that's one of the things I wanted to write about in, in saying beauty is your destiny. It can be your destiny in Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. And that's a wonderful transition to this, to this last question. And, and you've, you've already kind of touched on this. Maybe you want to push further into it. So those, so especially who are struggling with beauty and, and we're thinking particularly of, of Christians uh, who might, whether they know it or not, have a, a, a low view of creation and themselves as image bearers of the, of the glorious triune Godhead. So in what ways do you hope this book uh, aids who read it and listen to this episode? And I, I think uh, there is a value in being awakened to beauty that brings joy to life. And, and one of the benefits of, you know, a book like this or a conversation like this, it just, it gives you a label or something to think about, or it helps you notice something that is there and you haven't seen it. So I'll just give an example. We were talking at the very beginning that I'm a birder and I, I had an opera, I was in Mexico over spring break visiting some of our Wheaton College students went with a friend on a, on a mountain hike um, and was able to show him the birds that were there that you could hear and see that he hadn't noticed before. And he said, I'm, you know, realistically, I'm probably not going to become a birder. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I might admire CrossFit. I'm not going to become a CrossFit guy. <laughs> That's probably not me. I'm going to go play basketball. Yeah. But I now I've got something to look for. This is something I'm going to notice. And a capacity has been grown within me. So I, I think if people are more alert to what the Bible says about beauty, more alert to how important beauty is for our souls, uh, more aware of, of how um, the brokenness we experience in the world is both a manifestation of the brokenness of beauty, but also helps us see the hope that we need in Jesus. I mean, if we're awakened to more of that, um, I think that's a good thing. And I think that was a good thing as I was working on this book and people listening in or maybe reading, I think it'll be a good thing for them too. Yeah. And I just want to, you know, with the ending of the episode, just want to thank you too for helping us understand more about the objective truth, which is beautiful and our hope in living in that truth in a glorified state in even our hope in our in in our human bodies with our eyes we will see objective truth and see Christ face to face yeah yeah so um if you want to you've already talked about at, at the front end so if if people want to learn more about Whedon, where should they go and maybe just talk to people about Whedon, what you guys do yeah, sure so um you know Wheaton college serves Jesus Christ and advances his kingdom through excellence in liberal arts and graduate education um, that educates the whole person mm -hmm. uh, to build the church and benefit society worldwide. Um, that whole person is a, is a, expresses our understanding of human beauty. Um, we want to be involved in, obviously, intellectual formation. That's what a, a college campus does in every area of human thought. That's what liberal arts education does. Uh, but we also want to help students become beautiful in their relationship with Jesus and their witness for him um, in the world. And, um, you know, people can learn a lot about Wheaton just by going to wheaton.edu, um, uh, our, our website, and a lot to learn about Wheaton. One thing I'll say is if you ever visit campus, we've done a lot in the last decade plus. I've seen, make yeah. our campus more beautiful in the visual arts. It is uh, a gorgeous campus. Yeah, there's, there's, there's not much that compares now to on it. campus as well. So, yeah, come, come visit us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Riken, for coming on, for writing this book, for... Yeah talking to our listeners about beauty, the beauty of Jesus and the, and the beauty of ourselves and, and creation. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Have, have a great day, guys. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, 
talk about the book as well. Of course.